Hello friends, I am Deepak Balodi and I welcome you all to the lecture number 4 for the topic Extrinsic Semiconductor <coughs> and we have already discussed the course structure in this course of Semiconductor Theory that will be mainly considered in two major topics Effective Carrier Concentration, I call them effective because they are the free carriers uh, or the relevant charged particles which can uh, participate in current conduction. So once we calculate those carrier concentrations within a semiconductor per unit volume, then we can try to calculate the drift velocity, current density or conductivity. So then we will be going into the dynamics, which is basically the conduction phenomena. So this is in the analogy which we, um, in the same fashion which we did for the intrinsic semiconductors. We first found the carrier concentration there and then we went for the dynamics or the current conduction. <coughs> so the story uh, so far has been like this that we started with intrinsic semiconductors and we found that the carrier concentration of intrinsic semiconductor was not good enough uh, to provide us a good conductivity. We did a numerical on that also and we found that uh, for silicon specifically if we want to achieve a good conductivity in order to get a good current density com at commercial um, applications then the conductivity should be increased by at least 10 to the power 4 or 10 to the power 5 factor so that it directly results into the into the same improvement into the current density so therefore <coughs> with the concentration so far we have seen that for intrinsic semiconductor in that too if I take an example of silicon we have 10 to the power 10 electrons per centimeter cube and free holes are 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube which in general we call them NI intrinsic carrier concentration so with these numbers we have seen that conductivity as well as current densities are not um, a good numerical value so that we, we cannot utilize them so there was a motivation to go for some phenomena which can improve the carrier concentration first and then we can uh, achieve a better uh, current conduction. So in order to improve the carrier concentration we found that to improve the carrier concentration one key mechanism was to play around with temperature generally increasing it above room temperature but this we discarded at our very first place because uh, there are several <coughs> impractical aspects associated with this key uh, option as the, the very one is that everything or um, all the conduction phenomena we want to be at room temperature as well as increasing temperature uh, introduces lots of abnormal effects into the semiconductors so uh, this at all and, and also it is an unbiased effect uh, a random phenomena which doesn't provide any uh, resultant direction of the current so on to top of that we definitely require a lot of external force that is external electric field in order to get a resultant current so therefore all all these reasons uh, uh, they they definitely discard this method and in fact in opposition we would try not to have not to seek any variation in the temperature in fact uh, in the ideal most case we would not like to observe any um, temperature variation but that is not in our hand uh, whenever we get some temperature variation there are some uh, semiconductor phenomena some intrinsic carrier concentration increment is happening so we should be ready with those formula so in order to calculate the effective carrier concentration once the temperature increases and that's what we have seen already the next key uh, factor is providing providing the carriers externally with some impurity insertion in controlled amount. So impurity in insertion in controlled amount. The 
first of all we are not interested in any impurity we would like to uh, intentionally have those impurities which can result into some uh, free carrier contribution as well as in controlled amount so that process of carrier insertion will be in a very very controlled process so this whole thing is called as doping and as a result of doping the intrinsic semiconductor I'm writing in short IN is for intrinsic intrinsic semiconductor becomes the extrinsic EX I'm writing short for the extrinsic semiconductor so once we introduce the impurities within the pure intrinsic semiconductor and uh, with, with the sole objective to improve the carrier concentration we ultimately result in a in a different form of semiconductor which has lot of carrier concentration free carrier concentration of either holes or electrons or both of them uh, then that semiconductor the resultant semiconductor is called as extrinsic semiconductor and this process of doping uh, the process of impurity insertion in a controlled amount is called doping doping phenomenon <clears throat> so doping phenomena let me elaborate it like this now as the name suggests a trivalent impurity doping means the doping with those elements uh, falling into the third column like we have boron aluminium gallium indium as well as for penta so these are the third column elements and the fifth column elements are nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony and bismuth. So out of them we are not going to use all of them uh, means within the mesh of silicon like we have this mesh of silicon. So, <coughs> so the, the corner ones also are attached with the neighbor uh, silicon atoms. So any silicon atom is basically sharing four covalent bonds to its four neighbors, four adjacent silicon atoms. So <clears throat> therefore if we externally dope some impurity like boron and aluminium or gallium or indium but not all these four impurities are good enough, here we restrict our choices up to boron and aluminium and here we restrict our choices up to phosphorus and arsenic there are several reasons for that as boron and aluminium they find a better electronic affinity similarly phosphorus and arsenic they find a better electronic affinity with the uh, silicon as well as if we go uh, to the lower side like this or we go to the lower side like this then the atoms becomes heavier and massive uh, larger in size so uh, these uh, atoms or these impurities to the lower of the columns they are not uh, in good support of the integrated circuit technology being heavier and larger in size uh, they can harm the the silicon wafer as well as um, their diffusion and uh, and implantation processes which are the processes to dope something inside silicon they are not very well supported by the silicon so um, all because of the better affinity of boron and phosphorus boron and phosphorus are the most prominent one but we can also sometimes use aluminium here or sometimes we can also use arsenic here so <clears throat> in the trivalent impurity doping what happens is like this as soon as we import any uh, boron atom inside then here it comes like this but unfortunately boron atom has uh, only three uh, electrons in its outermost shell so there is uh, the deficiency of one electron so if all the four bonds are completed then it will be shown as the deficiency of one electron and that deficiency is shown by uh, one hole like this so this hole is free in nature so I, I do not indicate this hole in, in the boundation with the parent atom so therefore the three electrons which are at the outermost shell of the boron they quickly find the covalent adjustments but the remaining vacancy with any of the four bonds is almost it is incomplete like say this 
where it is incomplete in, in, a, in a sense, but if we have indicated whole separately, then we can call that it is complete. So, uh, one boron atom provides, now boron by boron, we know boron is a uh, trivalent impurity, it provides one free hole. Similarly, one phosphorus atom, let's say, as soon as it comes within the silicon, it finds a lattice point, a lattice space, it quickly releases one electron like this so as soon as the phosphorus atom comes inside now in the outer shell of phosphorus there are five electrons so therefore all these elements they are called pentavalent because in the outer shell of any of these atoms there are five uh, electrons so <clears throat> as soon as the phosphorus finds a lattice space it it replaces a silicon atom and finds a space then it quickly confirms the four covalent bonds with the four uh, neighbor silicon atoms but one electron of phosphorus is left and that becomes the free electron we are going to see this thing in detail so I'm just briefly pointing it out so one phosphorus atom provides one free electron if it is completely ionized so onto this ionization process I'll be coming very soon so therefore <coughs> the point to make here is that the third column elements which have the three electrons in their outermost shell they are called trivalent impurity for silicon as well as for germanium uh, semiconductor as well so as soon as they come and they sit inside specifically boron and aluminium and most popularly boron as soon as it comes inside it provides a free hole similarly the elements from the fifth column they are pentavalent impurity for silicon and germanium as soon as they come inside like phosphorus it quickly provides one free electron so therefore if we are trying to achieve some figure of 10 to the power 14 and 15 free electrons let's say then we'll have to provide 10 to the power 14 or 15 phosphorus atoms within the intrinsic silicon so this is kind of motivation so we'll be looking at this in detail but before that <coughs> let us understand what is happening uh, when we are imparting these things inside the silicon so we can understand this thing so there are two different cases so please consider one case at a time so let us come to this case ec ev this is the energy band diagram of silicon and so far uh, intrinsic silicon only and there is some intrinsic fermi level efi exactly lying in between the band gap <laughs> So as soon as we insert one phosphorus atom, it provides one loosely coupled electron. That electron is very much ready to come out of the foundation of that parental phosphorus atom. So the energy of that momentarily electron, which is ready to come out of the foundation and ready to move, ready to conduct, is shown by some level here, which is indicated as ED and called as donor energy level. donor energy level <clears throat> because as soon as we do the doping with either phosphorus or arsenic or any of this but the main choices are phosphorus and arsenic so as soon as we do doping with phosphorus and arsenic by means pentavalent impurity then they provide or they donate one electron to the uh, silicon lattice geometry and therefore in, in with this characteristic of donation of some electron these impurities are also called as donor impurities so they are also called donor impurities. So there are two names for this. Either they are called pentavalent because they have five electrons in their outermost shell, five valence electrons, as well as they are also called donor impurity because by nature, as soon as they come within the silicon lattice geometry, it readily provides a one electron. It donates one electron into the uh, uh, into the crowd of free carrier concentration so therefore that electron till it is bounded uh, within the phosphorus it, but loosely bounded because it is very much ready to come out of it so then the energy corresponding to that electron is shown by this ED donor energy level so electron is lying at this energy although we know that it is uh, no no electron can or, or there is no energy possible uh, within the band gap 
but uh, we have to understand it like as uh, it is the extrinsic case so this energy level is not uh, by the intrinsic nature of the silicon or it is not within the intrinsic silicon itself as well as this is a momentarily hypothetical energy level or temporary sometimes we also indicated quasi uh, state so all uh, this this all represents that as soon as an electron is there because this difference between EC and ED is so small this donor energy level is so much close to EC so that as soon as the phosphorus atom enters inside the silicon and finds a relevant lattice point it replaces a silicon atom very quickly that electron which is loosely coupled to phosphorus other four electrons have found the covalent bond so they are well attached now but the fifth one any of the uh, out of the, the, these five electrons the fifth one will be loosely coupled till it is here and as soon as it is detached from the it is away from the parental atom it will be shown as a jump from here to here into the conduction band so therefore now it is free so this transition from its parental phosphorus atom to the and and, and it gets totally detached from its parental atom happens very fast so um, th this transition doesn't take much time and it happens uh, almost at with the 99.99 percent probability because this energy difference this we need to understand this energy difference which is EC minus ED is called ionization energy of the of let's say uh, a particular impurity let's say phosphorus ionization energy of, um, of of the electron in the phosphorus atom once it comes within the silicon so let me only make it generalize ionization energy because to come out of its parental atom from the phosphorus it requires only this much energy and it has a certain value for silicon it is like this so for silicon nitrogen is not of use because it is in the gaseous format so we also do not prefer nitrogen as a doping element um, because being found in a gaseous form it is not good to uh, for the diffusion and ion implantation processes so it is very difficult to have some processing uh, integrated circuit processing with the nitrogen it is very very much light and small particle so therefore we the, the only preferred one phosphorus and arsenic and in the trivalent table it is boron and aluminium so with phosphorus the ionization energy this is the ionization energy table it is around uh, 0 0.045 and all the values are in electron volts this is the value of ionization energy so this is around 0 0.4 i'm sorry 0 0.045 electron volts for silicon for germanium it remains around 0 0.01 for arsenic uh, it is around 0 0.05 and this still remains same okay so <coughs> therefore we can understand with this value, with this ionization energy value, 0 0.045 electron volts, that even the room temperature, which is very much close to it, is far enough or more than sufficient to have this transition. Because we know that uh, other than room temperature, already electrons and all the particles, they, they have some um, energy profile. So not all energy is coming from the thermal side. So they are already within the uh, periodic functions of energy within the lattice structure and as soon as they get the favorable thermal energy also very quickly this transition happens so therefore i said we should we should need not to we need not to wait for this transition to happen this happens momentarily as quickly it happens but we should understand where the electrons are coming from so the donor energy level of phosphorus within the silicon is this which finds uh, a place just below the EC, just below the EC because this value is very very much small and as soon as it enters into a lattice point it replaces one silicon atom its loosely coupled electron is totally detached so as soon as it is detached it is indicated by this so so this transition is basically indicating the 
loosely coupled fifth electron getting d d attached from phosphorus atom so this process this transition is explaining this phenomenon that the loosely coupled fifth electron so the four electrons have found the well uh, better covalent bond but the fifth one is getting detached from the phosphorus atom so as soon as it is detached it is now the energy of it is indicated in the conduction band and now it is totally free to move within the uh, at this extrinsic semiconductor or the silicon geometry the same thing is going to happen here so let's make it very fast because everything remains same as an analogy but things get reversed because here the consideration is of holes so similarly if the same in the same silicon if we dope either boron or aluminium then let me again write the ionization energy level for silicon and for germanium so for boron again it is 0.045 electron volts every value of this ionization energy is in electron volts for germanium it remains same 0.01 for aluminium it is 0.06 and it remains same so these are approximate values you will be always provided by these <coughs> these values if at all they are required in any numerical so you will be provided with this don't worry but it is better to understand the values or remember some range of these values in order to appreciate the fact that uh, as soon as a boron element enters within the geometry of silicon its hole seems to be still attached but weakly attached with its parental boron atom but as soon as that boron atom finds a lattice point it replaces a silicon atom and finds a re relevant lattice point this loosely coupled hole is very much ready to come out of that parental effect or, or from the parental atom foundation so as soon as it come out we say that the hole has got free and then that hole energy will be indicated in the valence band so therefore once this boron comes within the silicon lattice so it finds some energy level ea where ea as an analogy is called the acceptor energy level acceptor as a hole is a positive charge in nature so it looks like uh, providing one hole we have accepted one electron in the reverse sense so therefore from there the term acceptor has come uh, because provision or providing one electron to the um, silicon lattice uh, is equivalent to welcoming or demanding one electron from the silicon so demanding or accepting one electron in the reverse process of this is acceptance of an electron so therefore the term acceptor impurity is for this so the trivalent impurity is also known as acceptor impurity okay so this is also called as acceptor impurities okay so both the names are correct now as soon as one boron atom is inserted within the silicon lattice silicon atomic configuration it finds one relevant see i am again and again i am saying it finds one relevant lattice point that with that what does i what do i mean actually that a boron atom uh, insertion will not be significant if it doesn't find a valid lattice points a uh, very brief comment on this you see uh, I'm, i have not gone into the crystal theory but if i indicate roughly if i indicate the crystalline geometry like this in 3d like in all 3d three dimensions it is the geometry is maintained periodically so therefore there are lots of spaces where a germanium uh, sorry where a boron or a phosphorus atom can enter so if a boron atom enters here within the void this is the void space so if a boron atom enters here then this is not a valid lattice point you know that there are these are the valid lattice point or lattice centers like this so they are making some unit cell geometry in 3d 
so only if a boron atom comes it replaces one uh, like it replaces one silicon atom and enters here now that silicon atom may come anywhere or that silicon original silicon atom which was here may go to some word or somewhere uh, we don't care about that but if it replaces one silicon atom from a valid lattice point then only this boron atom will be contributing uh, one hole or then only uh, one phosphorus atom will be contributing one electron if they find a valid lattice point so the original silicon atomic location is replaced by the impurity uh, atom so then only they provide their one hole or one electron so okay <coughs> So, um, as a simple case, because uh, this, this uh, finding a valid lattice point, um, as we have already discussed, we have therefore we have chosen boron and aluminium, specifically boron and similarly specifically phosphorus, because they found uh, very good affinity with the silicon atoms, and it has been found that um, for almost all the 99% cases or even more than that, almost all the boron atoms they find the valid lattice point. Similarly, phosphor phosphorus. In a very rare case, there may be some impurity atoms which they may not find, but all because the doping concentration is so high, so that that number is very much small, where they are not finding the uh, relevant lattice points. If some impurity atoms like boron or phosphorus, they are not finding a relevant lattice points, then the ionization don't happen, and therefore they do not provide or they do not contribute in providing any free carrier so we'll return back to this point after some time but so far let us assume a very simple case and which is the uh, which is the most practical case mostly uh, almost all the time statistically that almost all boron atoms will be completely ionized how many boron atoms are inserted all of them have got the valid lattice points and therefore all of them have got ionized Similarly, if all of the phosphorus atoms, they find the uh, valid lattice point, so all of them have got ionized. So, we are assuming that case only. Okay, so as soon as the boron atom enters inside, it replaces a valid silicon lattice point. It, it's momentarily loosely coupled whole energy will be shown by this. So, momentarily there is a hole as soon as it gets inside. But suddenly there comes a transition because again this energy difference this is Ea minus Ev again this is same ionization energy which we have already mentioned here so again you see that the ionization energy is again of the same order like here so as the room temperature is comparable enough or well comparable with these energy levels or these energy values so therefore even at the room temperature uh, thermal energy will guarantee that I am definitely going for complete ionization so therefore this thing will suddenly happen and therefore almost all the boron atoms how many boron atoms are inserted all of them will give one 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 hole each okay then let us come <coughs> quickly for some uh, doping concentration figures you see light doping case is now let us understand the silicon case only and then uh, the same analysis could be compared with the germanium anytime so uh, every time let us have the very standard figures for the silicon so for silicon <coughs> we have 10 to the power 10 electron and 10 to the power 10 holes per centimeter cube so we want to make this figure to get improved by 10 to the power 4 or 5 factor at least so we want to get something we want to add something to it if we want to make it uh, if we want to insert only n types only uh, electrons into this so we want to make some delta some impurity so that ultimately it goes to 14 or 50 so how much would we prefer to go so as soon as we get we, we see that how much do we want to get then this addition appears to be silly because the final result which we are expecting which we are targeting is so high so that the already present values are negligible in that so we are we are almost at the zero level so here onwards we can start appreciating the fact that this figure is negligible 
because what we want to achieve is so so high at least into the power 4 or 5 order higher than this so therefore what should we add is completely this so then only this is something like 10,000 or uh, 100,000 plus 1 is same as 10,000 so like that so <coughs> okay so in light doping case we generally have 1 is to 10 to the power 10 or 11 10 or 11 so out of 10 to the power 10 or 11 silicon atoms we are doping or we are inserting one impurity atom now impurity could be either this or this I'm not making any specific case of this type or this type but uh, out of 10 to the power 10 or 10 to the power 11 silicon atoms per centimeter cube we are just inserting one boron atom or one phosphorus atom so then out of the total atoms per centimeter cube so that figure is 10 to the power 22 so I am saying that out of 10 to the power 11 or 12 I am inserting 1 so out of 10 to the power 22 how much will it be so that will be 10 to the power <coughs> 10 to the power 22 divided by this so therefore the final concentration would be 10 to the power 22 divided by 10 to the power 11 or 12 so this approximately comes of the of the range of 10 to the power 10 or 11 so 10 to the power 10 can never be expected it, it is never good value because we already have we already are at this level so 10 to the power 11 or 12 I must say uh, 11 and if I divide by 10 to the power 12 oh, I'm sorry this was 10 and 11 I'm sorry so out of 10 to the power 10 and 11 so this will come around 10 to the power 11 and 12 so if it is 1 out of 10 to the power 10 then we will be getting 10 to the power 11 uh, 12 if it is 1 out of 10 to the power 11 then we will be getting 10 to the power 11 so any of these two figures we can have so so the final concentration will be this and all of these values are in centimeter per centimeter cube and this is called weak doping or light doping or very small doping effort so therefore the representation becomes either n minus or p minus see okay i did not mention this once we do a trivalent impurity then all of the impurity atoms are providing one hole so in that sense only concentration of holes are increasing so the resultant resultant semiconductor is called p type all because in that case we are expecting that there will be majority carriers as holes there will be more number of holes than electrons so this time it will not maintain the characteristic of an intrinsic semiconductor which was that the uh, hole concentration will be same as electron concentration so that will not happen once we dope with the boron atoms all all with these type of concentration figures then there will be lot of holes against small number of electrons so therefore the resultant extrinsic semiconductor is called as p type semiconductor similarly P for positive because there are holes in dominance. All because of the same reason, the resultant here is called N type. N for negative because if we uh, make the doping with the pentavalent atom or if we do the, uh, the donor impurity doping, then each one phosphorus atom donates one electron contributes one free electron so therefore lots of phosphorus atoms will provide lots of free electrons and those lots of free electrons will make a scenario where in the extrinsic semiconductor there will be more number of free electrons than free holes so therefore there will be dominance of um, free electrons over holes so electrons are dominating which are of negative charge uh, nature so therefore we indicated with the n type so the resultant extrinsic semiconductor as a result will be called n-type semiconductor and similarly here it is called p-type semiconductor so okay so <clears throat> but in this case of light doping when we are not 
doping with the high concentration so if we are doping with 10 to the power 11 boron atoms per centimeter cube we will be getting 10 to the power 11 holes as a result which is still far away from this figure so therefore it is called light doping or even if we are doping with the 10 to the power 12 number of boron atoms that means one boron atom out of 10 to the power 10 silicon atoms then out of 10 to the power 22 silicon atoms per centimeter cube we are doping 10 to the power 12 boron atoms per centimeter cube so here in this first column please understand this is out of these many silicon atoms we are doping one boron or one phosphorus atom so this this figure is not in per centimeter cube this is the resultant figure in per centimeter cube this one so when it is 10 to the power 11 impurity atom per centimeter cube or 10 to the power 12 impurity atoms per centimeter cube then this range of uh, impurity doping we call as poor impurity doping or light doping and the representations are with this if, if it results in n type means if we are doing it with phosphorus or arsenic the resultant will be indicated by n minus minus for weak doping for light doping if we are doping with the boron and aluminium and the figures are this then the resultant will be indicated as p minus semiconductor extrinsic semiconductor that minus again indicates the weak doping or light doping case similarly if the if we are going for this one out of 10 to the power <coughs> so uh, what, what it should be means now we want this figure to achieve on an average so therefore within less number of silicon we should have one boron or one phosphorus so there one boron or one phosphorus atom one impurity atom was out of these many silicon so we the resultant was not good so we want one boron or phosphorus atom out of less number of silicon so therefore it's to eight six seven eight so out of ten to the power six or out of ten to the power seven or out of ten to the power eight if we make it then again we can do the same thing so out of 10 to the power 6 silicon atoms we are let me make it 7 out of 10 to the power 7 silicon atoms we are inserting one impurity atom therefore if we divide it with 10 to the power 7 or 10 to the power this is not minus this is or either 10 to the power 7 or 10 to the power 8 so then the final concentration if we divide it with the 10 to the power 7 this comes around 10 to the power 15 or 14 so 10 to the power 14 or 15 this is the range of moderate doping or the very very much practical case with this as we have already seen to improve the conductivity with the 5 4 or 5 order we need to have this range of impurity so these many 10 to the power 14 impurity atoms per centimeter cubes are required or 10 to the power 15 impurity atoms per centimeter cube are required to give 10 to the power 14 or 10 to the power 15 free electron or free holes and this type of presentation is simply n or p because this is moderate doping then we can also have within much less within a far fewer number of electron a uh, fewer number of silicon atoms we can dope one impurity atom like if we dope one impurity atom out of only uh, four or five then the resultant figure would be around and to the out of 10 to the power 22 to the power 4 and 5 then this would be somewhere around 10 to the power 17 or 18 so 10 to the power 17 or 18 impurity atoms per centimeter cube is a heavy figure is a lot of free carriers so it is called heavy doping and it is indicated by either n plus or p plus so there is still to go but this much is far enough so we are not practically trying to achieve much more out of it uh, some figures might be missing so they are not very much strict like 10 to the power 13 is not there so 10 to the power 13 for some cases could be considered as a light doping or 10 to the power 13 impurity atoms per centimeter cube sometimes could be considered as moderate doping case similarly 10 to the power 16 sometimes is considered as a moderate doping case or 10 to the power 16 sometimes is considered as a heavy doping case so therefore it is not very strict but 10 to the power 14 
per centimeter cube or 10 to the power 15 per centimeter cube is the most viable, most prominent figure for moderate doping case. It's the most practical case for silicon. For germanium, we have different figures, but um, for that we need to wait for some numericals to happen. Otherwise, for silicon, we should at least remember these standard ranges. So, <clears throat> okay, as a as a final comment on this complete chart, we have seen the two doping cases. Uh, acceptor impure doping with acceptor impurity or we call them trivalent impurity. Boron and aluminium are the most popular choices. Out of that boron is much more popular. So when especially for silicon. So when we do so, there comes momentarily an acceptor energy level where a hole temporarily uh, is maintained at this but very soon as it comes within the lattice point it is deattached and it comes in the valence band it is free to move similarly if you do a doping with pentavalent impurity which is also called uh, donor impurity then the it, it provides one free electron so one atom of impurity to this side provides one free electron one atom of impurity from this side provides one free hole so therefore, these many 10 to the power 14 atoms of boron will provide 10 to the power 14 holes. Similarly, 10 to the power 15 atoms of phosphorus will provide 10 to the power 15 electrons, free electrons. Because as soon as they come, we are considering complete ionization case. So one, one atom will provide one free carrier. <coughs> uh, okay, so with this, we are now ready to go for much more detailed uh, atomic structure and the carrier concentration formula okay now <clears throat> so here I'm going to explain in detail uh, the correlation between atomic structure of extrinsic semiconductor and its energy band diagram I've already done uh, it for p-type but uh, let us understand the development how should we try to plot it for n-type and then with the same analogy we'll compare it with the p-type so for an n-type let me indicate the one impurity atom let's say first of all in between there is one phosphorus atom which has five electrons out of that one electron let's say is this so these are five electrons out of which four electrons they find well synchronism with the uh, covalent bond with their neighbor silicon atoms so like so if you notice any any silicon atom it, in the outer shell there are four valence electrons so they are in well coordination with the covalent bonds like this <coughs> and these four bonds are well maintained by the with the so again let us start from the very scratch as soon as we have inserted one phosphorus atom out of uh, some 10 to the power 7 or uh, 10 to the power 8 silicon atoms that we have seen already for the moderate doping so out of some 10 to the power 7 or 10 to the power 8 silicon atoms we have introduced one uh, pentavalent impurity atom that is phosphorus atom so I'm not able to show uh, you 10 to the power 7 or 10 to the power 8 number of silicon atoms in order to show you the one phosphorus atom so i am zooming in the picture at microscopic level i am show, showing you the case which is in the neighborhood of phosphorus atom that one phosphorus atom so it is all uh, too lot far away from this phosphorus atom we have all silicon atoms gathered okay <clears throat> then the immediate four silicon atoms or lots of silicon atoms make these four covalent bonds and one valence electron of phosphorus is left because in phosphorus outermost shell has five electron so this is loosely coupled to so that this I must say this is one loosely coupled electron seated at ED so this is one loosely coupled electron with its parent atom and it is almost about to leave almost about to be free why it is almost about to be free because we know that synergy level is ed just below the conduction ec edge and as soon as it enters into some valid lattice point which i have shown here uh, even the thermal energy is sufficient enough to take it knock it out and take it outside so uh, i need not to 
show you in a stepwise i can directly i could have directly said that this is a free electron so that's what i want to say but i am just giving you a progress a development that once it is here it is shown in the influence of this phosphorus it is still in the weak influence of this phosphorus atom it is weakly coupled because it is not sharing it is not maintaining any covalent bond and very soon it will come out of the boundation of phosphorus atom and then it will be called free electron okay and <clears> the <throat> same thing we can understand in the energy band diagram so on the horizontal scale i am showing the fermi dirac function this is the increment energy scale and let me have dark line for ec it's much dark line for ev valence band h so this all shaded portion is the conduction band this all shaded portion lower side is the valence band much lower and much higher and in between this there is no allowed energy state and initially if it was when it was intrinsic there was some efi intrinsic fermi level when it was intrinsic now because we are doping phosphorus it has it is now going to become extrinsic and when it was intrinsic we had some fermi level profile like this it was passing through this and this probability of being occupied by this level was exactly half means 0.5 <clears throat> so like that we have already seen so uh, just a point to remind you that when we had this scenario when we had this scenario then the the fermi dirac function this is this function is f f i e by this i i want to indicate that this is the fermi dirac function in the case when the material was intrinsic so when it was intrinsic this was the fermi dirac function and this was symmetrical about efi so therefore you can see the area here and if i plot the gce and gve roughly like this so this is gce function gce is effective density of state function or density of state function and the density of state function gve in the valence band is similar to that gve so for valence band density of state function increases when we go downwards the density of state increases when we go upwards so we have already seen this so there are lots of seeds available within uh, closer energies uh, as we move up and down exactly at the conduction and there is almost zero energy state available but as soon as we move up we start getting closer and closer energy states available okay <clears throat> so this is what we understand with gce and gve now uh, so when we try to find we we try to find for concentration of n we what did we do we did ec2 infinite integration of gce into ffe for the direct function so this is the multiplication of these two and integrating onto the energy scale so this is multiplication of this blue and this black curve which is ffee and then integrating means calculating the area so therefore if i calculate the area this would come because this is zero here and then ffe is not zero so because any one of this is zero so this will start from zero this will go to a highest value here because both are con uh, coinciding here then as soon as we move up then ffe becomes almost zero so again so therefore it is like this so this area is this value so this value earlier was ni when this was ffi so for the fermi dirac function for the intrinsic semiconductor gce remains same but for ffi e fermi dirac function for the intrinsic case that gives us the a uh, free electron concentration or intrinsic carrier concentration so that is this area so this is nothing but this area so this was ni is equals to n 
similarly uh, or only let me call it an i similarly here also because it was symmetric so f f i was this so 1 minus f f i so because for the valence band we found that n i which was p was minus infinity to e v g v e into probability of not being filled by an electron here that means being filled by a hole so 1 minus f f i e into d e indicates that this will give me an area and that area will correspond to the value of free holes that is n i here so that first of all i need to plot 1 minus f f i so that is the same as this being plotted here like this so if this and this will multiply the same area i'll be getting So exactly the same thing, Ni. And that's what we know very well that the N is equals to Ni, P is equals to Ni, N and P both are same in the case of intrinsic. So, so far I have only plotted the intrinsic case. Now what happens? Now because we have inserted a valid um, phosphorus atom into a valid lattice point and lots of phosphorus atoms, out of that only I am showing one case, there are lots of phosphorus atoms into this 3D space. So therefore, as soon as you try, keep on introducing lots of phosphorus atoms and each phosphorus atom comes with a, a donor energy level somewhere just below the EC. So this is a donor energy level known as ED. So one electron is temporarily seated here when it is weakly attached here as soon as it gets out of the foundation like here if, if it comes out it and this happens automatically we need not to worry about this this happens almost all in 100% cases uh, for complete ionization so that means a transition is occurring we have already understood this phenomena so therefore uh, there happens that all because more and more number of electrons are increasing in the conduction band please mind it more and more electrons are increasing in the conduction band and there is no symmetrical or similar effect in the valence band so their holes are not increasing because we are introducing an impurity which is only contributing holes so for uh, sorry which is only contributing free electrons so only the conduction band is being crowded and crowded more crowded that means more and more electrons are being here are coming here so therefore any energy level above ec will get a better probability of being filled by an electron so the fermi level uh, or the fermi dirac function has to shift so therefore a uh, new fermi level would be somewhere like this so this will be our new Fermi level, a uh, new Fermi Dirac function or I must call it new FFE or this is the resultant FFE, Fermi Dirac function. Once we have doped with lots of phosphorus atoms, then each and every phosphorus atom will provide a temporary donor state. So all of, all of the electrons will go into the conduction band very soon and they will make conduction band crowded. So any energy level like you assume a hypothetical energy level here so any energy level earlier its probability of being filled was this the black curve the point on the black curve now this probability has got increased from this to this because when there are lots of candidates then the probability that a seat is filled by that candidate increases automatically so therefore uh, it gives a, a resemblance or it gives a sense that the whole Fermi Dirac function will move upwards. So the new Fermi Dirac function will not be symmetrical about EFI. So this we have already seen argued that new FFE or this is only the final, I must say final will not be symmetrical about EFI. So FFE will move up. So it will move up. So therefore, <coughs> if you see onto this curve, we know that Fermi level is that level. Now let us identify the Fermi level. Where has it gone? It, it no more remains at EFI. So the resultant or new Fermi level will be that Fermi level 
whose occupancy of being filled by an electron will be half. So let me find half first. So this is the value half on this vertical scale. So therefore this will be the new Fermi level EF or final Fermi level. So this EFI is just for the sake of comparison that from where we have gone where. So EFI is not valid now. So the new Fermi level is EF. So EF has gone up from EFI by this value. And uh, so, okay, let me mark this also. I said this is the new or final EF Fermi derived function. Okay. So now if you see the Fermi level finally goes up in order to maintain its definition that its probability of being filled by an electron should be half and this is very simple to understand analytically also because lots of electrons are coming here but there are no corresponding holes coming here. So the, the, the scenario of vacant seat is almost same or even worse and the scenario of vacant seats here is being less or, or uh, there are less number of vacant seats here so the probability 0.5 that a, a seat is filled or not that probability 0.5 will shift up so therefore fermi level goes up so this is the new fermi level this red one okay then therefore the fermi level increment is this so this is called delta ef Now, the most important point here, <coughs> that now if you see, uh, because we have to calculate the final electron concentration, final electron concentration into the conduction band here. Again and again I am not finding any space to write new FFE, but okay now you know that this red curve is new FFE, new Fermi direct function. Okay. So, <coughs> Uh, I'm trying to find the uh, the carrier concentration here. So again, the, the same formula will remain valid. So n will be minus sorry, e c to infinity g c e into f f e d e. What is that? This is the multiplication of two function multiplication of f f e this new one this red one into uh, this g c e. So you see GCE is exactly 0 here, so it will start with the 0, it will go to a peak because GCE is also increasing and there is a good value of FFE here, so it will increase, but as we move up, GCE increases, but FFE goes down, so the total result will be like this, or even like this, so therefore this total area, now NI is not required to maintain, not required to be plotted. So this total area is basically n because this total area is nothing but it is e c to infinity because we have integrated it as, as you see it is decreasing function here f f e so therefore this area keeps on decreasing it goes to zero so therefore e c to infinity g c e into f f e in with respect to energy so this area is nothing but the shaded portion and this is very clear gce this blue curve multiplied by this red curve will give you the effective number of free electrons into the conduction band so as we can see this is the area this gives us sense and the exact one is plotted here similarly if you come here if we try to calculate the number of holes with the same token we know that we calculated with this from minus infinity up to EV GVE into the probability of not being filled by an electron. So 1 minus, you remember this, 1 minus FFE into DE. So let me plot first 1 minus FFE. So let's see this is FFE. And please try to notice one very important aspect that once the FFE, Fermi Dirac function moves up, from this black curve to this red curve it is shifting up while it does so then the probability increases here for any 
earlier energy state probability increases and for the same energy state here the corresponding energy state here the probability actually is decreasing okay so uh, decreasing in the sense for whole so that means if we try to plot 1 minus FFE so it will come like a red curve be like this okay so this is 1 minus FFE so 1 minus FFE into this blue GVE will provide the area now you see earlier when we made 1 minus FFIE that was this so for both the cases GVE has remained same so earlier it was FFI intrinsic this black curve now it has got this new red curve so one value out of the two product or out of the product of two two entities one value has got down or because one value has got down from black to red so therefore area will also get down so I am not showing intrinsic case anymore so the new area will be even lesser so this area is nothing but P and this is this integration this whole integration is this area so this is very interesting to understand that while you do a pentavalent impurity doping while we do a donor impurity doping then definitely obviously the the number of free electrons increase in the conduction band but number of free holes decrease in the valence band so sometimes the um, the happy part the good part is number of free electrons are increasing and this effect overshadows one very important aspect that the other minority charge carriers holes they will decrease also so not only uh, electrons will increase but also the electron the the holes in the valence band will decrease this is confirmed with this area analogy because the fermi level is shifting up so <coughs> with this we have now uh, got a very valid point that once we again proceed for this uh, integration then we come up with the the same result and similarly now for the P type let us quickly over have an overview will not give that much detailed analysis but you can see this is the scenario of a boron atom as soon as it enters into a lattice point it releases one hole or one hole which is weakly coupled or loosely coupled to it very soon an electron will be uh, going and occupying this place so it will look like a hole is moving so therefore hole will very soon leave the uh, parent atom and it will become a free hole so it is very soon about to free so as soon as you indicate this diagram you are eligible to say that this is a free hole but in order to maintain the development I am showing that this is weakly coupled first of all which is indicated by a temporarily energy level EA here dotted one and as soon as it is free which is the case almost 100% times so therefore it has a transition it comes here in the valence band that means a hole has become free now so therefore this is free to move and uh, again the, the black one is the earlier EFI and this red one is the new FFI that means the Fermi Dirac function here goes down because this time in the case of trivalent impurity doping which results into P type semiconductor so with trivalent impurity doping or with acceptor impurity doping we are only introducing lots of holes but no electrons so lots of holes are coming into the valence band so they are free so therefore the probability of not being filled by an electron should increase so therefore FFE will come down so the probability 0.5 that energy level where the probability was 0.5 will come down so therefore the Fermi level also comes down with this gap so this was earlier EFI and now the new EF is this so this much is the shift delta EF so delta EF here is EFI minus uh, EF this is new Fermi level so it is positive that means Fermi level 
goes down. So in P type of semiconductor means once we are introducing trivalent impurity or acceptor impurity, the Fermi level goes down by EFI. Similarly here, the delta EF is <coughs> EF minus EFI. which is positive, which says that something, some new Fermi level is going above EFI. So, it indicates that Fermi level goes up. So, this is a simple case for objective analysis. Okay, so with the same token, the Fermi level comes down and you see if we uh, have a heavy doping case if we dope lots of boron atoms then lots of free electron free holes will come into the picture so the shift of fermi level will be more or the shift of fermi dirac function will be more so when the shift of fermi dirac function will be more this area will further increase so let me quantify this thing larger the doping concentration that is indicated by Na. Later on, I'll quantify this. Larger the doping uh, concentration, larger will be the shift of FFE and EF. So, larger will be the shift of FFE and EF below. If larger is the shift, that means this area will increase area which is nothing but p will increase so therefore the final concentration whole concentration will increase and this will indicate that the corresponding concentration here will decrease we have seen this argument here so the n will decrease so <coughs> this is the same thing you can mention here as you increase ND which is the doping concentration we have seen three cases light doping moderate doping and this so for uh, pentavalent or donor impurity concentration we indicated with ND number of atoms per centimeter cube here we indicated with NA number of atoms per centimeter cube A for acceptor atoms impurity D for donor atoms impurity so with larger and larger ND means from light doping to moderate doping to heavy doping if we keep on increasing it the FFE the newer FFE and EF will keep on increasing upwards as they will keep on increasing upwards the area under the curve this area which is nothing but the indication of N will increase and if it goes further up this will further become smaller and therefore 1 minus FFE will become uh, smaller and smaller so therefore this area green one will get lower and lower so therefore area let me write this area this in conduction band which is n increases so area in valence band that is p decreases the same thing i wrote there so this is very much analytical information available on this board now you can compare the both the cases so with n type impurity the impurity concentration i mentioned in the last i'm sorry for that but here i can say impurity concentration you know the example phosphorus or arsenic is nd per centimeter cube and here the impurity concentration is Na per centimeter cube like in the example of light doping this Na is 10 to the power 12 or 10 to the power 13 or 10 to the power 11 only per centimeter cube okay or in case of moderate this is 10 to the power 14 or 10 to the power 15 or 10 to the power 16 also sometimes per centimeter cube for the case of heavy doping it is 10 to the power 17 or 10 to the power 18 per centimeter cube the same with this so ND and NA are the representation of donor and acceptor impurity concentrations respectively and 
here is the total scenario so uh, as we have understood that with the same formula with the same token we can prove the we can we can come up with the concentration of this in which we are finally interested this is the main objective of this topic that we have to finally calculate the total number of n now in extrinsic n type or in extrinsic p type semiconductor so for that we need to calculate it so what's the change in this the change is in this the new ffe earlier we did the same integration with ffi into e now we are doing it with the newer value which has got shifted up into the n type and the same integration with to calculate p free holes will be doing in the uh, p type semiconductor and the only change will be this value which is now 1 minus ffe where the ffe is the new value earlier we did it with the ffie in the case of intrinsic so the concept remains same the integration process remains same but the they there come the new value so those results are very simple to understand but before that let me produce a simple picture of analogy the one electron free electron here uh, resembles one field energy state here that means both things are same one field energy state or a better probability of being filled by an electron here is same as a free electron here one energy state being filled here by hole that means not being filled by an electron so a higher probability of not being filled by an electron here is same as a free hole here so these two things are well in coordination <coughs> so okay so how did we calculate it we how did we calculate is this so therefore the n because in in n type semiconductor we are tempted to calculate number of free electrons because with that objective only we did the pentavalent impurity doping because we wanted to have more number of free electrons so n or the uh, let me let me write this the electrons are the majority carriers here because ultimately we know that the there will be more number of electrons as the area itself indicates and the holes are called minority carriers here in the n type semiconductor whereas the situation is just reversed here the electrons are minority carriers and holes are called majority carriers because they are majority in numbers so <coughs> let me again come with this so therefore we are uh, as a first principle we are generally interested in calculating the majority carrier concentration so n is equals to this which is this area okay and once we proceed we, we are not going into the detail of these integration and this is not at all required also but the results are similar the results are that n will be equals to nc e to the power minus ec minus ef by kt with the caution that what, what change do we see here the only change which we see here is this that this is ec minus ef this time as it is ec minus ef this time but new ef is this so we are only processing with this difference earlier in the case of intrinsic one we had ec minus ef and that ef was efi so there we had this difference so earlier we were calculating this now we are calculating that only this ec minus ef so therefore this EC minus EF is supposed to be less number, a small number, a small negative appears to be a relatively large number. So we are expecting a relatively large number of free carrier concentration. Similarly, we can, uh, we can start here, we are interested in number of free holes, so this is conceptually, this is just to elaborate the concept, we are never going to use these integration, but just to clarify the concept from minus infinity up to ev from from some absolute reference to up to ev we can only find holes so this is gve density of states in this into 1 minus f f e so if we progress with this we end up having nv e to the power minus 
ई एफ माइनस ए वी बाई के टी एन सी एंड एन वी आर सेम दे आर इफेक्टिव डेंसिटी ऑफ स्टेट वी हैव ऑलरेडी सीन देयर वैल्यू देयर फंक्शन एंड देर दी फंक्शन ऑफ टेम्परेचर एज वेल एज देयर वैल्यूज ऑल्सो सो देर रिमेन द सेम द ओनली डिफरेंस कम्स हेयर द ओनली पॉइंट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट इज दिस only point of interest is this so in the case of p type semiconductor now we are calculating ef minus ev so this is ef minus ev so this time we are only calculating with this difference but earlier we were calculating with this efi minus ev so although formula says the same ef minus ev but we know ef in intrinsic is much higher position so ef minus ev is large in एफ माइनस ई वी लार्ज इन इंट्रेंसिक एंड ई एफ माइनस ई वी इज स्मॉल इन एक्सट्रेंसिक एंड सेम हेयर विद द सेम टोकन सो वंस दिस बिकम्स ए स्मॉलर द वैल्यू बिकम्स लार्जर बिकॉज दिस इज ए नेगेटिव सो इट इज रिलेटिवली लार्जर सो वी एक्सपेक्ट मोर नंबर ऑफ फ्री होल्स नाउ सो ओके but analytically we know because we have doped with uh, lots of uh, impurity atoms so uh, now now see the see some analytical pictures or okay uh, i'll be coming to that point later on but before that if this is this and similarly if you want to calculate p here you can also do so p is this is the majority carrier here and we expect it to be around nd because the donor impurity is around 10 to the power 14 or 10 to the power 15 earlier concentration was 10 to the power 10 electrons only now we have introduced 10 to the power 14 or 10 to the power 15 atoms of phosphorus one phosphorus atom gives one free electron So 10 to the power 15 phosphorus atoms give 10 to the power 15 electrons. So 10 to the power 15 electrons plus 10 to the power 10 is 10 to the power 15 only. So okay, it is like adding one into one lakh. That remains one lakh only. So therefore, uh, if we 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 need not to go for this analytically, we know if we are going for moderate doping or high doping case, then the final figure of the effective or free electron concentration will be same as nd similarly the final concentration of this will be effectively na which is the majority carrier here okay then we are basically interested into majority carrier but by the time with the same token we can also calculate we can also derive it for the minority carrier so minority carrier the whole there so if you want to exactly calculate here then this is minus uh the, the formula remain same here this is ef minus ev by kt now you see that this is minority carrier concentration minority concentration so this is not a standard figure this we do not know so far so <clears throat> with the same token if you see ef minus ev has got larger because within ec and ev ef has moved up so this has got lowered ec minus ef has got lowered but ef minus ev has got larger so ef minus ev has got larger there is a more negative value so therefore this is even a lesser number so p goes below its uh, intrinsic concentration so what we expect that p goes much much lower than its intrinsic concentration and here we are expecting that this n goes much much higher than its intrinsic concentration so this is what we expect here analytically similarly here we have calculated the majority carriers and we expect that p which is approximately as na so p should be much much greater than na because this value has got lowered similarly if we try to calculate n in the p type semiconductor so n yani electron in the p type semiconductors are uh 
minority carrier. So minority carrier concentration will be the same token e to the power minus e c minus e f by k t. So, but what we expect that n should be much much lower than n i because this value has got larger. You can see because Fermi level has moved down. So this value which is e f minus e v has got lower but e c minus e v e c minus e f has got larger because e f is coming down. So all because of that this value gets larger and larger and this e to the power negative is a lower value and we expect a poor n. So uh, please again I am minding you, I am reminding you this, this very important point that in n type semiconductor or by doing pentavalent or donor impurity concentration, doping concentration, the majority carrier, the carrier concentration of electron increases in the conduction band but by the same time the free carrier concentration of holes in the valence band decreases, area has decreased. One factor that we will be calculating with the same token uh, for the p type semiconductor with the <coughs> Uh, trivalent or acceptor impurity insertion, the uh, free holes concentration increases rapidly, very very high, significantly. The electron concentration in the conduction band decreases well below Ni with the same factor. The, the, these two formulas are not very much relevant for this because in order to calculate, to utilize them in numericals, we need to be given with NV or NC, NV or NC. So NV and NC are not very familiar values, very very familiar uh, functions. So we try to avoid NC and NV uh, or we try to avoid EC minus EV, EC minus EF. What is a better representation? See, <coughs> uh, we have already argumented that lower the value of EF is an indication a heavy doping case or a larger doping case. So, uh, in, in the p-type, in the p-type title, lower, we have already quantified this, lower EF results in a larger p and lower n. So as EF moves further down, means delta E, lower EF means delta EF increases. Because EFI remains at the same location, that is a reference. EFI is not valid here, it is now extrinsic. But as a reference, we still indicate EFI. So new EF is moving down because you are increasing the doping concentration. So in, in opposite sense, we can say if EF moves further downwards, we can say the doping concentration has been increased. That's what we understand with this. Larger P, that means NA is large. So the similar... If, if you see, if EF moves upwards and upwards and upwards closer to EC. So if EF moves up, that means delta EF increases. So, and it goes closer to EC. As this goes closer to EV, so it goes closer to EC, that means uh, we are ultimately going to get a larger, so this is the case of a larger N. That means we are doping it heavily. So this is the known fact due to that this is the result. But now if result is known to us that Fermi level is moving up, we can expect the cause of it. We can expect that we have doped it heavily. And the, similarly, the more holes will get down. So because this is, I have made very clear, if the majority carrier concentration increases, then minority carrier concentration decreases. And this is well in coordination with the mass action law. Because mass action law says, mass action law. It says that n into p has to be n i square, be it intrinsic, be it extrinsic, be any case, if thermal equilibrium is maintained, then the product of total free electron concentration into total free hole concentration should be n i square. So this is a general view, we are not going into the detailed explanation or derivation of it, but we will take this law as it is. 
that at thermal equilibrium this needs to be satisfied so therefore I am saying if n increases then p gets down similarly if p increases here in the case of p tie semiconductor n gets down so please mind it that in any extrinsic semiconductor if majority carrier concentration is going above ni then minority carrier concentration is also coming downwards but because the relevant effect or the main objective main focus area is majority so most of the time we neglect what is happening with minority we should not do this this is not a good practice but generally if you do so there is no harm because the main focus area is to increase the majority carrier concentration so therefore we, we most of the time we forget this phenomena that if majority carrier concentration is increasing we forget about minority but you should remember the minority the other polarity carrier they are decreasing also so okay we will understand this point again but what I am trying to make is the another form of uh, carrier concentration that is much more relevant here and that is okay so we have seen the final form n is equals to nc into the power minus e uh, c minus e f by kt uh, so from here if we try to write e c as <coughs> e v plus e g so if, if this band gap this is EC minus EV. So if we add on to this, uh, so we can write NC is e to the power minus in place of EC is EV plus this much. So this is EV plus EG minus EF by KT. Okay. then you see <coughs> EG is EC plus EV by 2 so if you do so then again we will come back to this value but here what we are trying to make is uh, EG um, we, we are trying to take uh, this EG is EC minus EV so EV EC minus EV minus EF by KT so EV and EV anytime you can cancel and you can come back to this value but here what I am trying to make is EC plus EC EC plus EV and EC plus EV by 2 is nothing but EFI so the Fermi level here intrinsic Fermi level which is not valid in the case of extrinsic but just for the reference that how much we have moved up or down for that we still want to compare with the intrinsic case so EFI is this so if we take 2 that side so this EC, this is 2 EFI. So therefore this is nothing but EC to the power minus this is 2 EFI minus EF minus EV by KT. We take 1 EFI with this, 1 EFI with this. So this will give me NC 3 to the power minus <coughs> EFI minus EF or let me write it the other way ok let me write it first like this EF minus by KT and then into what else remains is still one EFI is there and one EV is there EFI minus EV by KT ok so this we can write as nc so this i'll be writing later on let me write this first so nc into e to the power efi now efi as we all know efi we have already kept this value is ec plus ev by 2 so if you write this ec plus ev by 2 <coughs> or efi minus ev by kt is what if you see EFI minus EV and EFI is EC plus EV by 2 okay. right like this minus EV divided by KT into this factor e to the power I can take minus inside so this becomes EF minus EFI 
divided by kt okay now you see this is uh, ec minus ec plus ev minus 2 ev so this is ec minus ev by 2 so this comes as ec minus ev by 2 and ec minus ev is eg so this is e to the power minus eg by 2 2 here comes as 2 kt and this all if you try to remember ef kt so this if you try to remember this was what this was ni so <coughs> Because you see, Ni was A naught dash into T to the power 3 by 2 e to the power minus Eg by 2 kT. So this was nothing but coming from Nc. So therefore, Nc into this, Nc into this is nothing but Ni. So therefore, the new form which we have got is this. N, sorry, this is Ni into e to the power Ef minus Efi by Kt. So this is the final form. This is much more relevant, much more useful form. So let me write it finally I remember this you better note it down then let me write it here so this is one form we have already seen this is one form and the another form is also ni into e to the power ef minus efi by kt where EF minus EFI we can also write as delta EF. Here we have indicated this delta EF. EF minus EFI. So this is delta EF. So larger the delta EF, as we have already seen, larger delta EF will result into a higher concentration. So we know the result that delta EF Fermi level has got up, up and up. Then we can expect the cause of it that there must be happening a heavier doping or larger doping so <clears throat> this is what so uh, why, why this form is much more relevant much more useful because it every time compares how much extrinsic we have made a semiconductor at what extent we have made it extrinsic from the intrinsic so from this value of fermi level if Fermi level moves up from EFI Fermi level is move up that means semiconductor is being extrinsic and it is being n-type and if it moves further up if this difference increases EFI remains at same place if EF further moves up it in, it explains or it clearly tells the extension of n-type is increasing it is heavily extended so therefore n is increasing and with the same token here I can write you can again derive for the same here also the p comes as ni into the power e f i minus e f by k t so somebody can remember the majority carrier concentration is always ni e to the power delta e f upon k t delta e f is is, is positive uh, in both the case but the definition is different here it is EFI minus EF here it is EF minus EFI so in the case of N type it goes up in the case of P type it comes down the final Fermi level okay and again this form is much more useful because every time we have to compare as a reference from intrinsic how much extrinsic we have made um, as compared to with respect to the intrinsic concentration so these two formulas are much more relevant in the okay so having seen the major concepts of uh, carrier concentration one quick remark on to the minority carrier concentration because 
सो फार आर मेन ऑब्जेक्टिव हैज बीन टू आइडेंटिफाई दी मेजोरिटी कैरियर कॉन्सेंट्रेशन ऑल दो वी हैव एक्सपेक्टेड वन थिंग दैट द वन टाइप ऑफ कैरियर कॉन्सेंट्रेशन इंक्रीजेज लाइक इफ यू गो फॉर पेंटावलेंट इम्प्योरिटी डोपिंग लाइक डोनर इम्प्योरिटी डोपिंग दैन द number of free electrons increase so we call electrons as majority carrier there and the semiconductor becomes n type but in that simultaneously the free holes or the number of free holes that amount decreases as well so this effect we have um, expected and why this happens it requires a little bit explanation so let me again confirm the uh, the the mass action law mass action law is a law which is applicable at thermal equilibrium now what is thermal equilibrium uh, a brief idea about this is that <clears throat> if a temperature is maintained for a long time for a sufficient time then all the particles would come to a settled level of thermal agitation and if suddenly at the temperature is shifted from one level to another level then in between time or the time till the new temperature has not been adopted by lots of carriers is that the transient phase is thermal inequilibrium so like uh let silicon uh on that to intrinsic silicon let me take and let let suppose we have kept it at t is equals to 100 degree kelvin okay uh then at this <coughs> if it is maintained for a long time if maintained for a sufficient time then it results into thermal equilibrium and we know that what is mass action law for thermal equilibrium it says n into p is equals to ni square that we have already seen so but this is strictly applicable in the cases of um, thermal equilibrium and that's what we are just uh, trying to understand what thermal equilibrium is so uh, let's say we start from this and 100 degree kelvin is maintained for a long long time and in that case uh, n will be ni will be let's say i am not confirm about this figure i'm just uh, expecting something to be around let's say 6 per centimeter cube and p is equals to ni is equals to 10 to the power 6 per centimeter cube and over that there must be happening some delta n there must be happening plus delta n plus delta p so there must be happening generations so this value will be maintained this i am not confirming you need to go for the formula and then check it out i'm just taking it so don't go by the exact value uh, you can check it out it should be somewhere around 10 to the power 6 to 7 okay so Uh, then then over to the, these values there will be <coughs> some generations but all because this effect is also like delta n plus delta p are they are losing their values because they are combining so let me indicate it like this so here they are generating by a covalent bond breakage which we understand as a um, transition from a valence band to conduction band for an electron or for a hole for from valence band to uh, from conduction band to valence band so that is happening here but simultaneously at some other places there are also happening recombinations so this process when one electron and one hole they are finding each other and they are losing their their existences they are finishing of their lives so <clears throat> then that is called recombination so the rate of uh, this rate of this so therefore 
whatever happens above this standard value is irrelevant because the generation rate and recombination rates are same and also the generation and recombination uh, scenario is not so powerful so that it drives this to a very different value so at any moment if let's say for a very very particular moment if a generation rate is slightly higher than recombination rate so there are access carriers majority uh, so sorry there is no majority and minority both are uh, the same because this is intrinsic so um, there will be some delta n and delta p above its thermal value above this value but that value will be so small so that you can neglect it so as an average on an average time uh, the, the total will be insignificant so in totality that this process will give no resultant carrier so the electrons and holes will be maintained at these values now <coughs> suppose and, and uh, let, let me uh, have some figure the generation and recombination rate will be low but whatever it is it is low for generation rate it is low for recombination rate and both the values are same but but I am expecting that it is low because um, uh, there is less thermal agitation so there will be less number of covalent bond breaking so there will be less number of recombination because they both have to be equal but let's say then I increase temperature from this to this suddenly at T is equals to T naught uh, this is time so at T naught time suddenly the temperature is being increased from T1 which is 100 to T2 which is let's say 300 degree Kelvin so because there is an abrupt change in uh, temperature so the carrier profile will go like this so this is the temperature profile and carrier profile will go like this to the new value or let me have another scale for this so this is ni at t1 is equals to 100k after a sufficient time at time t naught so then after this the temperature has become t2 which is 300 but you have maintained T2 for a long time but suddenly when there is a step in temperature then up to some time T1 things will again come into equilibrium but in between time T0 to T1 there will be uh, a, a concentration which may not be the uh, settled value or steady state concentration at this so that we say that this is not the equilibrium uh, condition so this to this time phase is non equilibrium so this is obviously thermal equilibrium this when the values have got settled is again thermal equilibrium but it will take some now this time could be very very small in most of the cases we may not be interested into this but at some uh, in some particular examples and some particular experiments we might be interested into this transient phase when the carriers have suddenly the, the generation rate uh, may not be equal to rate of recombination generation rate is not same as recombination rate for this much particular time because at this time there will be more number of generation and in fact so, so you can say that this is oh, sorry 
this is definitely like this because there is required a new value of carrier concentration because we can calculate at, at, at temperature T1 we can calculate at 100 degree if suppose this is the number I have not calculated it you need to confirm it but if let's say at temperature 100 degree Kelvin if this is the number then at this there may be something Ni is equals to uh, okay at this we know that at 300 degree Kelvin the values are this is Ni at 300 degree Kelvin so this is 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube so this is N this is P so the values are increasing from this to this so in order to do so there is required an intermediate phase from time T0 to T1 time so in between this time there will be thermal non-equilibrium or in equilibrium so in that case the rate of generation will be definitely higher so that this goes like this then it could be even further higher but ultimately if it finds that it is going around 10 to the power 11 12 then some of the excess carriers will recombine and finally a steady state so it may be like this it may be like shooting up and then coming down then shooting up coming down and getting settled like a second order system response but whatever it is we are ultimately, if we are ultimately interested in the steady state at 300 degree Kelvin and if that new temperature 300 degree Kelvin is maintained for a long long time then we will be utilizing the new carrier concentration which is this either hole or electron. So this is what we understand by thermal equilibrium. If we maintain the temperature for a sufficient time for the uh, carrier concentration value to get settled then we say everything is in thermal equilibrium but if temperature is being suddenly increased or there is a sudden intrusion of some extrinsic carriers sudden then it takes some time for those newly introduced carriers to get diffused uh, we'll see that diffusion phenomena but we can basically understand that any any excess carrier any excess particle and at some local a region of a material of a uniform material will try to diffuse so that the concentration is maintained everywhere after some time so until it is not maintained uniformly that time phase which is taken to maintain that concentration uniformly that time phase will be a time phase of um, thermal equilibrium and in that case we cannot apply this because we know that at, at this moment the scenario could be different so, but at these two moments we can use this so n into p is n i square applicable here, n into p is n i square is applicable here, but n i and n i are different at both the temperatures. Here at temperature 100 degree Kelvin the n i is this, at this n i is different. Okay, so with this we, we have an idea of mass action law and thermal equilibrium. So what to with this? This explains the concept very clear, very clearly that let's say we start with intrinsic again, then let intrinsic silicon. So <coughs> at this, let's make it n is equals to n i is equals to 10 to the power 10 and P is equals to Ni is equals to 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube I'm not writing if I miss it somewhere you can assume this per cubic volume per centimeter cube okay then you see because thermal equilibrium is maintained and this I am expecting everything at room temperature so you can confirm that N into P is equals to the Ni square and that is 10 to the power 20 per centimeter to the power 6 okay then if I dope it with let's say a pentavalent impurity and that impurity concentration is indicated by ND donor impurity concentration acceptor impurity concentration is indicated by caps lock NA that is a standard terminology you can have your own so ND is let's say 10 to the power 15 per centimeter. 
so those many electrons uh, assuming that all all the, these these are basically number of atoms per centimeter cube number of atoms of um, let's say phosphorus so these many phosphorus atoms have been introduced into the silicons and assuming that all those phosphorus atoms they find the relevant lattice points so therefore they very soon as soon as they come into the intrinsic silicon um, they they very soon they give up their electrons one electron given by each one uh, <coughs> atom so therefore they are adding up or they are providing 10 to the power 15 electrons free electrons now this is a huge number so what happens that some part of it now, now, now this thing you are mixing here if this thing is being mixed here then what we get as a result what should we expect first of all what should we expect at n so new n uh, let me indicate it by n naught just to distinguish it from n and p so n naught will be approximately nd as we have expected because you see even uh, this number 10 to the power 14 or even 13 also if it would be 10 to the power 13 per centimeter cube even then that value will also be much much greater than this so now total and not is total number of free electrons after it has become extrinsic so now this is so as we expect that this should be equals to this so even if this is one or two order at least one order higher than this number then addition of this plus this is irrelevant because this is so so high so that nd plus n earlier n which is ni will be approximately nd so that's what we expect but one more thing what is happening so this is okay this is all about the majority carrier concentration but we are more interested in minority carrier what happens to minority what happens with p or p naught with p naught you see as soon as the, uh, the the intrinsic silicon free holes and free electrons as soon as they uh, they find that 10 to the power 15 number of free electrons have come into the uh, lattice so the holes will become very happy because holes are always trying to um, to get recombined with the um, electrons and electrons are always trying to recombine with the holes and um, uh, reducing their uh, energy and because every particle as I said is trying to minimize their um, energy in this world so therefore uh, the there will be a favorable scenario for holes free holes to get recombined with those many earlier free holes were only finding these many free electrons so the probability of being recombined was not very high because both were uh, having the negligible amount or very poor amount of concentration but still some recombinations were happening at the same time some generations were also happening so this thing was maintained the, these figures were maintained but now all because we have invited 10 to the power 15 new electrons free electrons so the holes will try to get recombined with almost all of the electrons if possible but there are only 10 to the power 10 holes so there is a very very favorable scenario very very favorable uh, case for all the holes to get recombined with this so we expect because this is a very very far very very higher number than this so we expect that almost all the holes will get recombined almost all so therefore what remains should be a very very poor number at least with respect to this because out of this almost all holes could be compensated by this large large figure so therefore what we expect is a very very poor number so therefore the number is basically should be given by uh, because we are assuming a thermal equilibrium case we are doing this and nothing is uh, being done in a non-equilibrium domain everything is being done in a equilibrium domain so therefore in a thermal equilibrium we are again expecting n naught into p naught to be ni square and because room temperature is maintained what we are we are expecting and that's what that's what is the uh, practical scenario as well the, there are slight fluctuations but those fluctuations of room temperatures are not much so that to uh, have their intake so therefore n naught into p naught should be ni square and ni square earlier was this so we can keep that figure so ni is same here because we have maintained the temperature everywhere so this this 
everything is happening at 300 degree Kelvin or at room temperature or maybe some other temperature but whatever it is it is maintained throughout so the only doping thing is happening but not the temperature variation so therefore if this has to be maintained then we can expect P0 to be Ni square by N0 uh, this is exactly equals to this but this we can approximate by Ni square upon Nd because earlier we have will be happening. So, <clears throat> therefore, now you see, if, if this happens, then ND is a, a far, far larger number. In this particular example, we have taken this. So, let me calculate. So, N naught here is approximately 10 to the power 15 and P naught will be ni square that is 10 to the power 20 upon nd is 10 to the power 15 so this comes around 10 to the power 5 so this is the figure so therefore what we expected that the final minority carrier concentration would go to a much much low value or it will be almost negligible in front of this because almost all holes will find a favorable scenario to get recombined with this so therefore the, the, the minority carrier concentration will also get down therefore as a result if we conclude then we can generalize this scenario in both the cases n type and p type so it is like this n type extrinsic semiconductor and let's say p type extrinsic semiconductor so what is the final scenario now <clears throat> let's say the donor impurity concentration is ND and let's say the acceptor impurity concentration is NA and both the values are per unit volume so number of atoms of uh, pentavalent impurity per unit volume or in case of in order to make the semiconductor extrinsic p type we'll have to have the acceptor impurity doping or trivalent impurity doping the number of atoms per centimeter cube will be any so the examples are boron and aluminium here the examples are phosphorus and arsenic now uh, but we are assuming uh, the complete ionization case we are very quickly um, about to come to this topic but assuming the simple case which is complete ionization means um, whatever atom or whichever atom has entered into the uh, silicon lattice structure has got a valid lattice point and therefore it has not gone into any void uh, it is it is going and replacing one um, well attached silicon atom so therefore it is occupying uh, a valid lattice point and if this happens we call the scenario as uh, complete ionization and as soon as it comes into, uh, into the silicon lattice it provides or donates one electron similarly so so therefore um, all the nd number of atoms will provide one electron so therefore there will be nd <coughs> number of electrons per centimeter cube which are externally inserted similarly in this case there are any number of external holes or the uh, any number of impurity holes uh, I'm sorry the holes which are provided by the impurity uh, which are externally inserted so when this case happens then the final concentration so initial initially it was Ni so finally N reaches much much above Ni and the, now we know the value N is approximately Nd because we, we expect that lot of additional carriers have come similarly the P goes well well below than this and therefore we have seen that approximately it is given by uh, this mass section law Ni square by N so if I write it exactly first of all I must write P is equals to Ni square by N but now I say approximately because N is approximately ND this. 
So why I call it approximately? Because additionally there were uh, or initially there were an i number of free electrons. So over to that additionally we have added nd. All because nd is at least three or four orders at least greater than ni. So therefore um, it is illogical to add uh, ni plus nd. So nd is at least three or four orders more than that. So it effectively it only comes as nd. So therefore it is nd plus something that something is almost negligible in front of this nd. Okay, similarly, the final concentration here, so earlier it was Ni and the final concentration goes like this. The majority, this is majority carrier here, electrons are majority carrier in N type and holes are minority carrier. Similarly, if we come to the P type extrinsic semiconductor, both things doesn't happen simultaneously. We, we can only encounter with one type of case. So Ni goes, to, uh, so here it goes to approximately Na because we are expecting that P has gone much much beyond Ni. Similarly, the minority, so this is majority carrier. Majority carriers are those who have got larger density or more numbers uh, as compared to the other one. And the minority carrier that is electron is exactly equals to from this formula, whatever it is given by, this is this, but approximately, we know because P is approximately Na, so we can call it Ni square by So these are electrons, holes in electron concentration in P-type semiconductor. This is the majority, this is minority carrier. Similarly, electrons are majority and holes are minority in N-type and these are the concentrations. So uh, it appears like if it is so simple then why did we waste a lot of time into understanding the Fermi level like we understood that EFI moves up in the case of extrinsic semiconductor like n-type it moves up and whatever it moves up the amount delta EF decides the final carrier concentration n that also we have seen so it conflicts like it says it doesn't conflict I mean it, it it says that uh, if it is so simple then why should we remember this because you see if the uh, problem statement comes from the Fermi level shift if, if this scenario is not provided like if ND is not provided if it is not the, the problem statement is not into the atomic structure or not at the um, atomic density level or the problem statement is more into the energy band domain then we might be asked that if Fermi level shifts by this much, then what would be the final carrier concentration? So therefore, we still we should uh, remember uh, the relations with the energy band diagram. So with the energy band diagram, now we know how to calculate majority carrier concentrations. And once we calculate majority carrier concentration, in order to get minority carrier concentration, anytime we can go for mass action law. So. Um, these and these things are equally correlated. So if any time this has been asked, we can calculate um, the shift in Fermi level or if shift in Fermi level is given or the uh, Fermi level location with respect to EC or EV is given, then also we can calculate uh, using the previous NC and NV formula. So this is the, in totality, this is the simple case. Now let us make the case more complicated. What if ND is not much much higher than NI. So earlier P is equals to NI, N is equals to NI in intrinsic. Then we add in order to make it N type, we add ND. And suppose ND is only barely one order more than NI. Then we cannot say that ND is greater greater than NI. Or in that case, we would like to maintain uh, some earlier concentration NI plus additionally plus ND and then some part of it goes to cancelize or uh, recombine with holes then some complicated thing should come so this thing or this case is only applicable when uh, so, so these cases let me conclude applicable when ND or NA any one thing out of this because these are two separate cases when ND or NA is much much greater than NI. Now how to decide this much much greater, what is this? So generally in mathematics we know that if some figure, some numeric figure is at least 
two order or at minimum one order greater than the another one which we are adding with then we can consider the the larger figure much much larger than earlier one so therefore uh, it's a general sense that uh, if you want to come up with the high accuracy result highly accurate result then at least you see that there should be a difference of 10 to the power 2 like for silicon already we know that ni uh, ranges in in 10 to the power 10 so if nd or na means if it is n type then it is nd if it is p type then it is na so if nd or na is given at least 10 to the power 12 or more like 10 to the power 12 10 to the power 13 10 to the power 14 then we can very easily assume this case and we can simply solve with this but if for same ni that is 10 to the power 10 nd or na lies somewhere around 10 to the power 11 or 10 to the power 12 although this is not a um, opportunistic uh, case or this is not a favorable case i must say because then we are not exploiting the use of doping but somehow if the problem statement is that nd or na is uh, only one order or barely two order greater than this then we should take some precaution and we should not go by these approximations then then there are more rigorous calculations which we are heading towards